All right, it's Mr. Lewandowski coming at you with part two. Global issue, authorial choices. Global issues, authorial choices. Sometimes you start with a global issue and you go, what do I care about most in the world? What do I care about? I really care about death. I wonder how different rituals of death have been uh, surfaced in different novels, poetry. Man, it seems like people are really interested in that idea. I wonder if I could do an analysis of authorial choices in the depiction of death that would say something meaningful about what it means to be a human being. Right and wrong, I'm interested in right and I'm interested in different kinds of punishment. How can you punish people for bad behavior? Are we doing it the right way? Are we doing it the wrong way? Are there punishments that are unjust, inappropriate, wrong, don't help? I wonder if any great works have ever been written that examine this idea of power and punishment. I bet there are kind of authorial choices. So in the last video, we examined all of these wonderfully wide, very expansive thinking is what you want. Expansive thinking. You're thinking very broadly, atrocities, laws, punishment, different, uh, different ways to create uh, art, different ways to look at nature, the impact of nature, technology, AI, it's all climate change, it's all there if it's a global issue that you care about. But where is it in the work and how does the author surface it through the work? That's what this video is going to be about. Um, we're going to look at uh, some beautiful opening pages from Cormac McCarthy's All the Pretty Horses and we're going to be thinking about authorial choices. Um, so when you're thinking about authorial choices, we got some new colors for today. We got new colors. When you're thinking about authorial choices, ultimately, you know, this is a literary analysis class. You know, so that word is, it's not a description of what the author did. It's not a uh, investigating things that, you know, are clear in the text. It's about analysis. And if you're going to an do analysis, what you're going to be doing is examining boo -doo 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 choices. How do you go about examining those choices? Well, it's a certain kind of reading that you're that you're going to do. A certain kind of reading. And it, it's like, man, it's like a laser. You're just focused. You're focused in every moment on like, you know, it's it's meaning. You know, so you're looking ultimately like at the meanings that are available in the text. Um, and you're also looking at yourself or the reader, and you're looking at things like emotion, like your emotion, or like the reader's emotion. Are you feeling sympathy for a character? Do you like a character? Do you feel like you don't really know a character? All of these, it's almost like the word that I like, you know, and I don't use it in a bad way, but it's manipulation. You know, skilled writers manipulate the readers into feeling certain things. There's also effects like tension. Tension is like, oh my God, what is gonna happen? Oh, what is going on with this person? Is he gonna get caught? Is she gonna, are they gonna, hmm, what's gonna happen? That's tension. Um, there's other effects like humor or like surprise. And so the, the writer takes you on a journey. Ultimately, there's like meaning, like it's some, it's just some combination of these different things, emotion, tension, humor, surprise, different effects as you're taken on a journey, but the destination is meaning, and, and the ultimate meaning, the, like the one that we really put high on a pedestal is like, we call it the theme. The theme is like, all right, why is this thing like? What? Is, what? Why was it written? What, is, what are we supposed to get out of this? What are we supposed to gain from this reading experience? Ultimately, is theme. So all of this I've talked about. None of this <laughs> is author's choices. So authorial choice creates this. So this right here is kind of like what it's all about. I have to get another color because this is just too cool. Um, this right here is what it's all about. And there's other aspects to this but like ultimately like this is the big stuff about your reading experience choices 
are what feed into this. Choices are what create this. The author's choices are what enable this. And if it's a work of art, this could be incomparably valuable. Like this could be like a new understanding of humans. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> this experience that you have reading could be redefining. It could change who you are. So it's a big deal what this is. Like we think that that's a big deal. Us English teachers, we think it's a big deal. And so when we look at the choices, it could be as small as a bunch of pronouns in a paragraph. It could be the size of a paragraph. It could be a one sentence paragraph. So in thinking about the choices, you know, we want to think about when we're reading something, we want to think about things like structure. Like the structure is how is it built? And a key element of structure is time. How does the author manipulate or take us through time? So our flashbacks present, you know? So structure is like time. Where does the story start and where does it end? Does it go back in the, does it, is it move linear, like right through time? Or does it start at the ending and give us the beginning? Like structure is kind of easy to see, like, what moment? Like in this, it starts with a moment. Why this moment? You know, the story is very big. It has, it's, 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 a, it's a person's life. But why did the author, Cormac McCarthy, choose to start this moment? The boy looking in the mirror. Who is a young man? He's 19, 20, something like that. 17, maybe. Looking in candle flame. Like he's in the hallway. He's looking down at his dead grandfather. Like, why? Why there? And so your analysis is ultimately answering all those why. Why there? Well, because death is a major theme in this work. This work examines death in a bunch of different ways. And so it starts with a death. It's also about lineage and about ancestry and who your parents and grandparents are and what does that mean for you. And so it starts with death is change. Death is the ultimate change. This story examines change. And so that structurally is why. The author didn't write that. Cormac McCarthy didn't write that. That's me. That's me doing my thinking. So analysis is very much about my thinking. Or if it's your analysis, it's about your thinking. So that is an arrow. And what we're talking about is my thinking. And so one of the reasons that we, that we, teachers of English, we value literary analysis is because it puts your thinking, I'm going to do this, this is, a, this is a plane, on the same plane with some very good thinkers. Cormac McCarthy is a top-notch thinker. And when you write a paper or when you do a uh, a, an individual oral focused on his choices and the world that he created, you are thinking with someone who's very good at thinking. And that's, that's, that makes you a better thinker. So that's valuable. Structure. Uh, time is huge for structure. Uh, time and uh, what else is structure? Well, structure has different elements. Structure is also could be things like sentence structure. So the big question for structure is like, how is it built? Little paragraphs, big paragraphs, long paragraphs, short paragraphs, paragraphs that move forward in time, paragraphs that sometimes move backwards in time. Um, how is it built? Um, another thing that's huge is like narrator. Narration is like, there, and there's just different things we could write about the narration but like for this one this right here is sneaky that was not sleeping that was not sleeping because you're like whose thought is this because here we have lastly he looked at the face so caved and drawn amongst the folds of funeral cloth the yellowed mustache the eyelids paper thin 
that was not sleeping. That was not sleeping. Those are his thoughts. That's him thinking in his head. But the author did not say, McCarthy did not say, and now he thought that. It just, so the narration is like, gives us his perceptions, but it gives them to us in a sneaky way. You know, so we don't want to say sneaky narration, but what we'd want to say is that we have, there's an omniscience. So that's kind of a degree of omniscience is how we would say it. We have an omniscient narrator that has the ability to look inside of the of characters' minds of all the characters. Well, we don't know. Sometimes it's just one. Sometimes they limit it to the internal perceptions of one character so we can really feel the story from the inside, even though it is in third person. The candle flame, his hat, his hat. So narration style is a big choice because it enables certain things to happen, certain effects, maybe tension, maybe an emotion, maybe an empathy. That's what I would add. So I would add empathy here to like, you have an empathetic experience reading. It draws you into the story. You, you know, these are choices that are made that draw you into the story. All those things are tremendously important. Tremendously important. Uh, structure, narration, style, things like uh, language. All right, and language is very broad, as you can tell. Language. We have another thing that's called style. So narration style is one thing, but style is a different thing. Tone is huge. Language, tone, you know, language, and, and language, we can talk about the, the key different kinds of language are literal and figurative. Figurative language is a whole nother basket of different terms, which some people, you know, there are things like, is that a metaphor? Is that a, is it a personification? Is that a, you know, those are all figurative uses of language. Um, so literal literal, figurative. And really, if you're writing a paper about, a, if you're doing a literary analysis, it's very possible that you would concentrate on structure. Boop. And not talk about narration style, language, or tone. It really depends on what the work is and what your interest in the work is and what your global issue is. All of these things are for you to decide. They're all in flux. They're all possibilities that are out there. So a uh, little over a tone and tone can change. You know, tone, one paragraph might have a certain tone, another paragraph could have a different tone. You know, so um, things like, you know, a, a figurative use of language is irony. You know, so I want to put that down underneath figurative. But these are like, you know, you can find a list of what are called literary devices or figurative language. That's all part of language. Tone is sometimes these are overlapping categories. It's like these, you know, they're sometimes they're overlapping, sometimes there's different ways to understand them. It can be a mess. Uh, tone is huge. Oh, what else? I think I'll leave it there for now. Um, so I'm gonna read this. I'm gonna read this. You'll get more out of this video if uh, if you read it. And in fact, this video, well, we'll see, we'll see. I'm just going to read it. See how, see, it's going to be 20 minutes long. See how long it takes me to read it. But as I'm reading, think about these things structure, narrative style, language, tone. You know, a, a kind of figurative language is, so I said irony was figurative. Also, images are huge. Um, you know, I'm going to write one other thing right here syntax. Syntax, I'm going to write syntax. And then, like, I'll give it, I'll say syntax and repetition. Repetition is really important. It's easy to spot as well. <laughs> Literal, figurative, irony, and imagery. They're just kinds of figurative language that are important. The candle flame. So if you don't, if you want to read this yourself, you can pause the video and uh, pause the video. It's going to be longer, so it'll probably be more like 35 minutes if I if you read it with me. Um, if you wanted the video to be shorter, 
Um, once I'm done reading, I will explain choices for some time. But I do want you to read it because it's so good. So if you need my help to read it, I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. This. And this. The candle flame and the image of the candle flame caught in the pier glass twisted and righted when he entered the hall and again when he shut the door. He took off his hat and he came slowly forward. The floorboards creaked under his boots. In his black suit he stood in the dark glass where the lilies leaned so palely from their wasted cut glass vase. Along the cold hallway behind him hung the portraits of forebears only dimly known to him all framed in glass and dimly lit above the narrow wainscoting. He looked down at the guttered candle stub. He pressed his thumbprint in the warm wax pooled on the oak veneer. Lastly, he looked at the face so caved and drawn among the folds of funeral cloth, the yellowed mustache, the eyelids paper thin. That was not sleeping. That was not sleeping. It was dark outside and cold and no wind. In the distance, a calf bawled. He stood with his hat in his hand. You never combed your hair that way in your life, he said. Inside the house, there was no sound save the ticking of the mantel clock in the front room. He went out and shut the door. Dark and cold, no wind, and a thin gray reef beginning along the eastern rim of the world. He walked out on the prairie and stood holding his hat like some supplicant to the darkness over them all, and he stood there for a long time. He turned to go. As he turned to go, he heard the train. He stopped and waited for it. He could feel it under his feet. It came boring out of the east like some ribald satellite of the coming sun, howling and bellowing in the distance, and the long light of the headlamp running through the tangled mesquite brakes and creating... Out of the night, the endless fence line down the dead straight right of way and sucking it back again, wire and post mile on mile into the darkness after where the boiler smoke disbanded slowly along the faint new horizon and the sound came lagging and he stood still holding his hat in his hands in the passing ground shutter watching it till it was gone. Then he turned and went back to the house. She looked up from the stove when he came in and looked him up and down in his suit. Buenos dias, guapo, she said. He hung the hat on a peg by the door among slickers and blanket coats and odd pieces of tack and came to the stove and got his coffee and took it to the table. She opened the oven and drew out a pan of sweet rolls she'd made and put one on a plate and brought it over and set it in front of him together with a knife for the butter and she touched the back of his head with her hand before she returned to the stove. I appreciate you lighting the candle, he said. Como? La candela. La vela. No fui yo, she said. La señora. Claro. Ya se levantó. Antes que yo. He drank the coffee. It was just grainy light outside, and Arturo was coming up toward the house. He saw his father at the funeral, standing by himself across the little gravel path near the fence. Once he went out to the street to his car, then he came back. A norther had blown in about mid-morning and there were spits of snow in the air with blowing dust and the women sat holding on to their hats. They'd put an awning up over the gravesite, but the weather was all sideways and it did no good. The canvas rattled and flapped and the preacher's words were lost in the wind. When it was over and the mourners rose to go, the canvas chairs they'd been sitting on raced away rumbling among the tombstones. 
In the evening he saddled his horse and rode out west from the house. The wind was much abated and it was very cold and the sun sat blood red and elliptic under the reefs of blood red cloud before him. He rode where he would always choose to ride, out where the western fork of the old Comanche road coming down out of Kiowa country to the north passed through the westernmost section of the ranch and you could see the faint trace of it bearing south over the low prairie that lay between the north and middle forks of the Concho River. At the hour he'd always choose when the shadows were long and the ancient road was shaped before him in the rose and canted light like a dream of the past where the painted ponies and the riders of that lost nation came down out of the north with their faces chalked and their long hair plaited and each armed for war which was their life and the women and children and women with children at their breasts all of them pledged in blood and redeemable in blood only when the wind was in the north you could hear them the horses and the breath of the horses and the horses hooves that were shod in raw hide and the rattle of lances and the constant drag of the travoy poles in the sand like the passing of some enormous serpent and the young boys naked on wild horses jaunty as circus riders and hazing wild horses before them and the dogs trotting with their tongues alaw and foot slaves following half naked and sorely burdened and above all the low chant of their traveling song which the riders sang as they rode nation and ghost of nation passing in a soft corral and all remembrance like a grail the sum of their secular and transitory and violent lives. He rode with the sun coppering his face and the red wind blowing out of the west. He turned south along the old war trail and he rode out to the crest of a low rise and dismounted and dropped the reins and walked out and stood like a man come to the end of something. There was an old horse skull in the brush, and he squatted and picked it up and turned it in his hands. Frail and brittle, bleached white paper. He squatted in the long light, holding it, the comic book teeth loose in their sockets, the joints in the cranium like ragged welding of the bone plates, the muted run of sand in the brain box when he turned it. What he loved in horses was what he loved in men, the blood and the heat of the blood that ran them. All his reverence and all his fondness and all the leanings of his life were for the ardent hearted and they would always be so and never be otherwise. He rode back in the dark. The horse quickened its step the last of the day's light fanned slowly upon the plain behind him and withdrew again down the edges of the world in a cooling blue of shadow and dusk and chill. And the last few chitterings of birds sequestered in the dark and wiry brush. He crossed the old trace again and he must turn the pony up onto the plain and homeward, but the warriors would ride on in that darkness they'd become, rattling past with their Stone Age tools of war in default of all substance and singing softly in blood and longing south across the plains to Mexico. Well, that's a brilliant piece of work right there. I mean, wow. So choices, what choices can we talk about in five minutes? I will talk for five minutes. Well, structure. Interestingly, structure, time, how is it built? Well, somehow he was able to put the past onto the present. And he did that through his choices in this gorgeous paragraph right here. 
right after his the funeral where he saw his father, then there's this passage right here. So uh, if you look at, so what's happening here is, oh my goodness, okay, so color. So what kind of choices color is a choice? Setting is a choice or how to construct the setting. You know, what are the, what are the elements of the setting? So color, setting, he's on the plains, he can see the whole sky, he is under the sky. And here we have the sky, blood red, reefs of blood red cloud, like a dream. So these are all the little language choices that we could examine. So you could write a paragraph where you said, in this paragraph, McCarthy is able to bring to the reader's attention the way that the past is still present in the West. So setting, American West, cowboys, the plains, this violence that's like a whisper of violence, violent lives, nation and ghost of nation, enormous serpent. So we have specific choices. You can't use the ser word serpent without an allusion to Satan, you know. So, so what do we? So that's like an allusion. But just because you notice that it's an allusion is kind of meaningless. You have to loop it back into, well, what's the meaning? What's the theme? What's the emotion? Was it tension? Is it something? You know, what what do I have? And it, it, what does it have? It's not like it's not like these are the only ones possible. Tension here. Like, what does it do to the reader? What does this do to the me as a reader? this paragraph so that's kind of the kind of thing that you want to do when you're examining those choices is like read a paragraph you know 40 lines if you're thinking in terms of your oral you're thinking about 40 lines that's about 40 lines so what you say is like what does it do what is this doing to me what is it doing to me as a reader is it's making me like have this reverence like a feeling of reverence a feeling so that's an emotional of like reverence and like this beauty, like you can tell this is a beautiful, this is a beautiful landscape, but it's also like an equation with what is beautiful and also what is violent. And it's also very much like what is the, like nature, like the, like the nature of these people, the nature of those natives on the landscape and like how are they still there? They're not, well, they're not still there, but they're there as a metaphor, as a memory, as something that is still alive on this landscape. So the landscape itself, and landscape is hugely important in this novel. So what else goes here? We've got these choices here. Uh, setting is huge. Bam. Setting is in there. And then like, how? What is he doing with the setting? Here, he's infusing the setting with what will become a major theme, which is like beauty, violence, landscape, and a question of like, what is the nature of, and also a journey. What were those, what were those natives doing? They were making a journey across a landscape. So if you're gonna talk about a journey and you're talking about a piece of fiction, you're talking about a quest. And so like, that's, that's, a quest is a journey where someone discovers themselves. So he's established a quest into the past, across a threshold, eventually going to Mexico. Brilliant work. Those are just a few of the choices. The choice that you examine depends on the global issue, the theme, what you think the book is about. You cannot do that without authentic, personal engagement looking for meaning, looking for value. That is your job.